There's no doubt that for parents, the death of their offspring by illness, accident, violence, drug abuse, or whatever means, can be a life-changing and devastating event. So it's not surprising that many books have been published on helping them to handle grief and to cope with the future when this happens. At issue is whether the parents see death as total extinction of their child or a transition for them to a life in a greater reality. Several of today's mediums have written books on how parents might learn to accept that their child's consciousness has not been extinguished since they've moved on to a new realm. Take this by America's James Van Prague. His book, Growing Up in Heaven, follows the path of a child's soul once it's on the other side, how they live in this dimension and their continued connection with the living. Van Prague says he's listened intensely for thousands of hours to the subtle whispers between our earthly world and the finer, etheric world of spirit. He sees love transcending the physical world, offering parents assurance that their departed family live on in what he expects to be a usually happy environment. Another spiritual teacher and medium is Joe M. Higgins. His first book, Hello, Anyone Home? How Our Deceased Loved Ones Try to Contact Us Through the Use of Signs, was well received for helping people understand the process of contact. His latest book was launched in 2020, Always Connected, for those who've lost children. Children give signs and insights from heaven. He's something of an authority on these signs, with his insights provided by the children themselves. One reviewer said this book answered many questions relating to when the reader's daughter was the victim of a murder-suicide 20 years previously, pointing out that this book covers suicide, murder, addictions and more. Another concluded that such signs give hope to parents wanting to continue their relationship with their child in spirit. If you look at the traditional psychical research literature on this topic, you find references to children in the afterlife are widespread throughout, but barely anyone has brought this material together to provide a single coherent picture. The one exception I found was this, When a Child Dies by Sylvia Barbonell, published during the Second World War. Her surname, by the way, Barbonell, is very significant in psychical research in Britain. While alive, her husband, Maurice Barbonell, was an important character in British spiritualism for two reasons. Firstly, he was the founder in 1932 of Psychic News, which is still published today. And for your information, the University of Manitoba in Canada, seen here, hosts the archive editions of this newspaper from 1932 to the present day. It's free and it's got a searchable database that I've used on sundry occasions which responds to keywords. This is the front page of the very first edition of Psychic News. And in case you wish to make a note, here also is the online address for the archive. Even more importantly for some people is the fact that Barbonell, who was himself a medium, ran a home circle at whose seances the famous spirit guide Silver Birch appeared to offer his teachings. Silver Birch's presence in spiritualistic publishing is well known around the world, with at least 13 books to his credit. So let's take a look at the Barbonells before moving specifically to Sylvia's book. This is the background against which we should understand her contribution. Morris Barbonell was born in London in 1902, one of six children of Polish immigrants. His father, Manuel, was a barber. And while growing up, Morris witnessed regular disagreements between his mother, who was very religious, and his father, who was an atheist. At one point, Morris, who remained agnostic in religious matters, was challenged by his friends to investigate spiritualism for six months before drawing any conclusions about it. Once he'd agreed to take up this challenge, he joins the home of a Mrs. Blaustein, a trans medium who did not particularly impress Morris with her skills 
although this group had an upside for him since he met one of its sitters, Sylvia, later to become his wife. During one of Mrs. Blaustein's seances, Morris fell asleep and on waking was told that he'd been in a trance with a Native American Indian speaking through his vocal cords. Quote, it was my first mediumistic trance, he said, and what happened to me was a complete blank. Apparently, Silver Birch originally spoke in a husky guttural tone far different from his later eloquent voice. In 1932, Morris and Sylvia were married and formed their own home circle, with Silver Birch providing regular teachings through Morris in trance. Apparently, he did not like this trance condition, since he wanted to know what was being said through him. Silver Birch claimed, I am but an interpreter for those who have sent me to expound forgotten laws that must be revived as part of the new world that's gradually dawning. He described a group of communicators who'd harmonised their minds to create the messages that Silver Birch gave. So he seemed to represent what's known as a soul group. There's only one great spirit, he claimed, who's provided eternal laws for the control of every phase of life throughout the boundless universe. Subsequently, Morris lectured frequently on spiritualism in both North America and Europe, as well as here in Britain. He and his friend Hannan Swaffer, a famous journalist and editor, spent three years addressing public meetings at weekends to audiences totalling 250,000 people. And this added to Barbonell's growing fame. After his death in 1981, Spirit messages were delivered from Morris himself through his close friend, seen here, the medium, Gordon Higginson. It was in the same year as his marriage, 1932, that with no journalistic experience whatsoever, Morris Barbonell launched Psychic News with the encouragement of spirits on the other side. One wealthy investor in the paper, who came to the rescue when it fell into financial difficulties, was Arthur Findlay one of the best-known authors on spiritualism. He was a retired Scottish stockbroker who also bequeathed his huge home, Stansted Hall, to the British Spiritualist National Union as a college for training mediums. Morris remained editor of Psychic News from 1932 to March 1946, and he returned again as editor after the paper had once more fallen into financial difficulties this time for 19 years, from June 1962 until his death in July 1981, aged 79. So now we come to this book published by Sylvia Barbonell in January 1942, right in the middle of Europe's war with Hitler. Whereas other psychical research books tend to provide dates for the cases they report on, Mrs. Barbonell did not do so which in my view is a shame. She was heavily involved in her husband's work, editing some of the Silver Birch books and contributing to Psychic News. And with her intimate knowledge of its contents, it's not surprising that many reports in her book come directly from the first 10 years of its production. Assuming that Psychic News can be trusted as an honest source of information, its 228 pages contain material both anecdotal as well as sensational in many instances. And on numerous occasions, Mrs. Barbonell asserts its evidential nature. What we learn from children's statements made in seances include, for example, that they remember the names of their siblings and friends from when they were alive, that they can see in the dark at seances using their spirit eyes, Remembering that the war was ongoing with the hatred of the enemy, the common currency, one child stated, They did not tell me when I was on earth that I was German, but it makes no difference here. Also, these children claim to remember attending their family's Christmas festivities both before and after they died, and many reported being looked after by family members who'd already passed over. 
while remembering details of their lives on Earth, as in, for example, the arrival of a new family pet, with one child saying, You did not have her when I was there. You have somebody now to take my place. And some children stated that, for example, their granny took them to visit their mother still on Earth when she'd fallen ill, and they appeared to accumulate knowledge of their families through listening to earthly conversations. Significantly, some children chose to manifest at the ages that they'd attained at death, while others did so at the more grown-up age that they'd reached since they died, claiming not only that they continued growing up, but also that they were receiving education in the spirit world and enjoying themselves immensely. A couple of challenging ideas were included in the book that even children who were just a few hours old at death also continue to exist in the spirit realm, as indeed do children never born alive owing to miscarriages and stillbirths, and who therefore gained no experience whatever of an earthly existence. This is startling indeed, I'm just reporting the contents of the book, and there are a good deal more such revelations. But let's move on, since Another aspect Sylvia Barbonell mentioned is how deceased children may act as the guides or gatekeepers for mediums at seances, which she indicates is actually not uncommon. Take the American medium, Ethel Post Parrish. Her young Indian spirit guide was a girl called Silver Bell, seen here. In my YouTube documentary, Can Spirits Materialize?, there's an episode in which shutterstop photography shows her form materialising on stage. This is controversial evidence since, as you can see in this photograph taken from that series, she looks like a cardboard cutout figure. But she's reported as developing past this stage and able to walk and talk with sitters. Other examples given by Sylvia Barbonell are of mediums from the 1930s and 40s some of whom have now been largely forgotten. People such as Louis Bolt, who worked through Young Ivy, Bertha Hurst's control, Rosie, Gladys Osborne Leonard's control, Feeder, Lillian Bailey's Poppet, Frank Decker's boy, Patsy, Helen Duncan's Peggy, Leslie Flint's Mickey, and Pamela Nash's Topsy, who was born into slavery when she was on Earth. Mrs. Barbonell says some had a lively sense of wit and repartee, being cheerleaders to keep the seance vibrations humming along and contributing, therefore, to the preceding success. And she says, in many instances, these young spirits knew little but misery and suffering during their own short earthly lives. To sum up this book, of which there's far more content than I've referred to here, I get the sense that Mrs. Barbonell was pretty much incapable of taking a sceptic's perspective as she was thoroughly immersed in and accepting of spiritualism in all its aspects. In many cases, her stories are the stuff of newspaper sensation. So I found myself cautious in embracing all of this material. But now I'd like to turn to two children who've related evidence at greater length and detail. One of them is Billy. In this booklet, Billy Grows Up in Spirit. He was a working class Cockney lad from London who died in a car crash while he and his friend were stealing the vehicle, which behaviour possibly brought Billy into a lower, darker sphere where he was earthbound and lost for several years. For those of you unfamiliar with the word cockney, it refers to anyone born within the sound reached by the church bells of this church, St Mary Le Beau, on a thoroughfare called Cheapside, a central position in the old city of London. To be born within the sound of Bow Bells is the traditional definition of a Cockney, a true Londoner. These days, anyone with a London accent is likely to be given this name, whereas the real community of Cockneys 
is really quite small. Their speech is notable for its characteristic accent and a way of using rhyming slang to replace common English words in phrases such as Would you Adam and Eve it? meaning believe it. Then there's apples and pears, meaning stairs. Bees and honey replaces money. Current bun stands for sun. And he's brown bread means he's dead. There are hundreds of such examples. Billy began communicating with Earth through a rescue group to whom he gave plenty of details describing life for children on the other side. The second case is an upper-class girl called Elizabeth B who died as a teenager. I say upper-class since the family had servants. I found this case in the book They Survive by the psychical investigator Miss Beatrice Gibbs working with the famous trans medium Geraldine Cummins. These communications were recorded primarily in automatic writing but also on the Ouija board. This is the only known photograph of the two working together and They Survive was published in 1946. It's expensive to buy today but it's available for free download from this website iapsop.com. Now let me warn you that you may think these children's descriptions of the afterlife are simply too outrageous to be believed. When the author and the renowned physicist Sir Oliver Lodge published a book entitled Raymond about the survival after death of his son who died during the First World War, he was publicly lambasted for its incredible content. In the book Raymond described fellow soldiers on the other side with him as smoking cigars and drinking whiskey and this the critics simply could not accept. It was a step too far. So hold on to your hats because these children make far more startling revelations than caused the condemnation of Sir Oliver Lodge's book. Now let me quote, I've been talking to spirits and having good conversations with them for 20 years. So for me the evidence that there's life after death is overwhelming. So said an English Justice of the Peace, Michael Evans in 1998 reporting that some people remain in an earthbound condition, unable to move on to higher realms of the afterlife until they're rescued either by helpers on the other side or by a rescue group of earthly volunteers. This topic was covered by me initially in 2017 in a documentary entitled Spirit Possession, Spirit Release and it featured the work of a psychiatrist, Dr. Carl Wickland, an American. But this time the emphasis is on spirit rescue. In 1991 Michael Evans joined such a group because heavy casualties were expected in the Gulf War. The group's four trans mediums wanted to assure soldiers killed in battle that they were being helped to get to the other side, to the higher realms. As the group's recorder Evans noted every word in these rescue group meetings, mostly using tape recording. And the interesting thing here is that not only soldiers came through to this group, one non-military character was a lively young cockney lad with a great sense of humour named Billy. He returned to the group repeatedly for four years to chat. As Michael Evans put it, our rescue group was successful in helping over 30 soldiers to escape the confusion of the battlefield after their death and make their way to higher dimensions. And with regard to Billy, he claimed, the joy and excitement the next world offers to anyone dying in childhood is something the world should know about. I was fascinated by the wonderful system of teaching and counselling that children get in that world. Superior, I think to anything that can be offered on Earth. Now, before I continue, I apologise in advance to all Cockneys for my possibly pathetic rendition of the Cockney accent and to those who may suffer accordingly. Referring to the medium through whom Billy spoke on the first occasion, Billy denied being dead. She says, I'm dead. I mean, that's a laugh, innit? I ain't dead. Well, 
or don't think I am anyway. Then he told how the car that he and his friend were stealing crashed, and yet Billy failed to recognise that he died until he was persuaded otherwise by the rescue group. I went home to see me ma'am, tried to talk to her, but she was crying so much. So I said, blow it, I'm going out. Who's going to stay round these flats when you can go out, eh? Later, he wanted to know why his mother couldn't talk to him, and we know the answer. The group discovered Billy was born in 1957. I've been wandering round a very long time, he said. It's dark down here. I couldn't understand why Day didn't come. Then later he announced he was not 10 when he died, as originally thought, but nearly 13, which means the car crash occurred in 1970, 21 years before he finally met the rescue group. A few months later, Billy surprised its members with a return visit, informing them that he'd experienced flying up a rainbow and down again, and that he now had a teacher. He's nice. His name's Trevor. Don't sound like an angel, does it? But he's lovely. He loves children. He died trying to save a child. And one of the things that Billy learnt from this teacher was very similar to what Elizabeth also had to learn when she arrived on the other side. How to make things with your own mind. We have to make things by thinking about it. Sounds stuff, doesn't it? They make this box, a lovely big box, and you try to make something inside it. Then they open it and see what you've done. Had it done properly. Some funny things came out, but we have to learn to make things by thinking. Here's not like school what you lot do. If you want a toy or something, you have to make it. Concentrate into the box, and that holds the material together, they say. I made a football, I did. These grown-ups, when they do it, they go, just like that. And there's this train, or flowers, or a building. It's fantastic, amazing. Now, if I want to change my clothes, I'll think about some other clothes I want to wear, and they're on me. Billy was very approving of school. All the children I'm with are like me, never really had nobody around much. We're looked after by people in what's called the children's sphere. I help some of the little ones now, yeah. Elizabeth B, as you'll see later, did something similar. Some of the baby ones come and I help them, make toys for them in the box, Billy reported. They're not always that good yet, but I made a little rocking horse for one the other day, this baby what come. And he says, I think I'm a bit quieter than I used to be. They say, I oh, will get older, but not that quickly. I've got to learn yet, and i got to learn a lot to earn it. But now he found fun in learning. I tried to make a tree the other day. You've never seen anything so funny. It was all stiff and didn't move. The funny thing is, if you go, oof, it goes away again. It's great fun. But they say there's a serious side to it as well. His great joy is that unlike Earth, learning is not desk-bound or only in classrooms. This will sound funny. I went on this lake and they showed us pretend fishing. Because we haven't done things you've done on Earth, we have to learn. But we didn't catch any fish. They just showed us how people sit in boats and do fishing. And we didn't catch any because the fish are too lovely. Beautiful, all pretty colours. They come up to you and touch you. The teachers showed us the lines. We hung them over the side with a sort of bell instead of an hook. You can talk to fishers and get their thoughts. A sort of picture and a tinkly sort of feeling. They can send you laugh. If you swim, they can swim along with you. You can go swimming in your clothes and you don't get wet. 
Referring to his history lessons, he said, We saw a windmill using wind created from the teacher's mind. There's movement of air around, so trees and things move a little, but there's no great heavy winds such as there is down here. Then they showed us a water wheel and the first steam engine, and you can see them all working. Very interesting. And it's all conjured from the mind. On another visit, Billy said, This Gervais you were talking to before me, he brings lots of animals for us, not just dogs and cats, but snakes, camels, elephants, like a zoo. We go out in the fields and they say, we're going to learn all about animals. And we talk to them, touch them. Some of them lets us ride on them. I rode on an elephant's trunk. He's lovely. We're learning biology, insects and things, a load of spiders and a praying mantis. They talk to you. A bee sends thoughts of honey and you communicate by sending pictures and smells. We have to learn what smell it's like. Some of them don't smell too good, but they don't smell as horrible as your animals on earth. At a later visit, Billy acknowledged he was making progress. Originally, I come from Peckham, I did. I got lost when I died and wandered around a long time. But I'm going on up the ladder a bit now. And later he adds, I'm really in quite high classes now and having to catch up on my education. Then the talk gets more serious. Billy refers to a sweet lady called Water Lily who tells them about people who are lost. And some, he's told, have been there longer than he was. They're in these other places. They take us down there sometime and I feel sorry for them. It's sad. We walk around and have a look and they tell us about working to help them. They say, I could try to do that, and I think I might do. They say that's what I'm training for. And he says, I'm sort of just finishing college and going to university, somewhere about that level. And regarding his personal development, he adds, well, I know I sound to you like I always was, Cockney, but I'm different now, and I think you might not recognise me if I came back to you as I am now. I moved on quite a bit. I'm quite a scientist these days. And he referred to the Hubble telescope being repaired in space. I can stand there and watch them, and they don't know it. They think they're so clever, all out there alone. But they're not alone. We're watching and trying to help them. There they are, all inside these suits, while I can just sit outside on Hubble. We don't feel cold. We travel by thought and... And about this space thing, he reported. Cool, there's some things there, mate, I couldn't tell you. You talk about science fiction, but it's science fact for us. And there are ways to travel, you lot ain't got the faintest idea about yet. You think you know a lot, and all these people talk about warp factor A, but something else is something that will work one day and you'll be able to go to the stars. You'll have to. You'll meet beings, that's for sure. I don't know whether you'd call them people. Some of you have met them already, but you don't really know. Talking about his history lessons, he said, we go to a place where you sort of step back in time and see it as it happened in those days. It's the Akashic Records, or part of it. We step back in time and really see it going on because we ain't got no time. I don't understand it, but there. Billy also informed the group that where he was, they have areas for children in line with different seasons on earth so they can see leaves falling in autumn and snow in winter because you see 
Most of the summer land is just sunshine. So we got places set aside, like a big valley with the trees going all coloured, or spring with what you got now with daffodils and things. As you'll see shortly, Elizabeth B indicates similar areas in her world. On one occasion, the famous actress, when alive, came to the group and described Billy as she saw him. He's a fine young man now, but when he comes down here, he takes on this younger persona again. But he's great fun, intelligent, kindly, thoughtful and a lovely soul. If only you could see the light that comes from him on this side. I thought you'd like to know that. And Billy himself said, when I'm over on my side, I'm able to talk better. When I'm here with you, I goes back to me Cockney. I suppose you wouldn't know me if I didn't speak Cockney. But although he sounded like a kid when speaking, it didn't prevent him from offering adult advice. You've got to learn control of your mind. If you can control your mind, then when you come over here, you're going to find it a lot easier. It's worth practicing. That's why thinking a thing, visualizing a flower, a bubble or whatever, really seeing it, smelling it, turning it around is important. What is significant here, as you'll see shortly, is that plenty of Billy's testimony is similar to Elizabeth B's, despite her contact through Miss Cummins taking place 70 years before Billy's contact through his rescue group. Let's turn now to Elizabeth B. This child who died aged 15 was unknown to Geraldine Cummins, the medium. Their contact took place six or seven years after Elizabeth's death, so she should have been 21 or 22 at the time, if alive, except that she adopted the persona of a very young girl with round childish writing her mother said that she recognised. With Miss Cummins in a trance, Miss Gibbs asked the medium's gatekeeper called Aster to try to find this girl who was the daughter of a friend of hers. He was successful, starting the communication through the Ouija board on the 31st of May 1924 and continuing over three years until June 1927. The first message was, tell my mother I've now reached a state in which I can find peace. At first I was in a feverish dream resulting from parting from the body. I was told I was only at the beginning of things and that when my mother died I'd meet her again. And Aster, Miss Cummins' gatekeeper, described Elizabeth as having a gentle disposition, being not very cultivated nor very bright. On the second occasion they communicated, Miss Gibbs read a message to Elizabeth from her mother, and this delighted the child, who continued giving details of her own life since she died. Because the medium and Miss Gibbs took a summer break, there was then no communication for four months, after which the girl stated, I've waited so long, how is mummy? So despite the notion that the afterlife is characterised by what's called non-locality, that is to say, it exists outside of time and space, this idea of hers waiting a long time does indicate a sense of time existing on the other side. And young Billy also talked about time passing, as indeed did the deceased Sir William Barrett in my documentary about him. Elizabeth claimed that if she wanted to meet her mother again when she died, Elizabeth must keep alive in her mind that this was what she was wanting to happen. Those who don't do this, she stated, don't necessarily meet up after a person's death, so they may go to different worlds if they're differently developed. There are so many different places and conditions over here, you would be bewildered, she reported, while sending love to her mother, whom she understood was feeling disappointed and sad and worrying. Subsequently, this was proven factually correct. Her mother had been very worried and also financially troubled. However, the next sitting, the girl stated that the new year would be a better one for her mother 
and something quite lucky would happen to please her very much. Somebody will leave Mumbo a little money. At least I saw that, but I can't tell you when. But it will be a great help. This good fortune came to pass, suggesting that Elizabeth really could see at least a little way into the future. And in this, she's not alone. Others have reported similar things. As I mentioned in my 2020 documentary about Geraldine Cummins, Elizabeth was poorly educated, rather backward, and she admitted at the time, I was rather stupid when I was alive, claiming, if I'd lived, I think something bad would have happened, so they took me away to save me from being unhappy. They thought I'd learn better here without being hurt, so I escaped when I was only a girl. On the topic of education, Elizabeth stated she was now learning how to change and grow, having been unable to learn quickly when alive. But I've been quite bright since I came here, she confirmed. You see, I found the rest of myself here. Everyone does. There's only a small bit of you alive now on Earth, but there's a lot of you still over here. I simply mean that there's a great deal more to you than you think, and it's divided and joined at the roots only. She told Miss Gibbs, I wanted to tell you this to show you I've learnt things even an old person like yourself doesn't know. There's a lot more information in this vein, but she concludes, aren't I awfully wise? I wanted you to see I'm not a dunce now. I'm really only a bit of myself when I talk to you. Miss Gibbs emphasises that the style of this communication was unlike anything one could imagine coming from the medium herself. One thing Elizabeth explained was virtually identical to Billy's reports, that children on the other side were taught to create through their thoughts. Home is made for us by older minds when we first come here, she reports, but we're soon taught how to change it by seeing the picture of what one wants in the mind and then believing it's really there, which is so hard. I had to make believe lots before anything came at all. The first thing they taught was how to think the place you want to have about you, she reported. We build just as children build brick houses, only we're taught to make the bricks as well. And it was lovely the first time I was able to think a horse and then see it there in front of me. Even Daddy couldn't do that. And she was excited at a recent discovery. I and a girl called Ruth have just learnt how to travel on the thing out of which we make our world. In a way, it's like air. We found it has lots of colours, and we float off on these colours, going as quickly as a train, as quickly as the wind. It's simply splendid. Well, this sounds so similar to Billy's idea of flying up and down a rainbow, so maybe it is. Several months later, Elizabeth was back saying, I know lots of things you don't know now. I've been living in a lovely place where there's a spring garden that changes just as the year does on Earth. The people here taught me to set the garden by the time on Earth. It's made out of what we can remember. It isn't solid like the Earth. Yet it seems the same. But if you came to my lovely garden, you wouldn't see anything. It would seem just air to you. Isn't that funny? Well, this description is not identical to Billy's claim that Earth-like seasons are created for children to experience, but it is very similar. But if we didn't make our world out of thinking, there'd be nothing but light around us, Elizabeth asserted. At one point, Elizabeth referred to what she called one hard kind of work. It was similar to Billy's. She meets little children who've just woken up on the other side and may not know that they're dead. They cry because their nurses or mothers aren't with them. So I play with them and tell them not to be silly. I try to make them learn to use their new eyes. I show them they have lost their bodies, but just have new ones that are very fine not like ugly earth bodies. Besides, you see, ugly old earth bodies were made to make people want things dreadfully that they couldn't have. 
that these new bodies are pretty and don't have pain and don't need food. The air and light give us what we need. I show these little children about the place we've made ready for them and they get quite happy when they see the houses, trees and fields made out of the minds of the nice people here. The children soon feel at home and are not frightened when I tell them that they've died. They're so excited by the lovely world that we have for them. Elizabeth B's final words when her communications ended were Give my loving messages to Mumbo and tell her she's the dearest, best mummy in the world. And she thanked Miss Gibbs, saying, I've been so happy since you let me talk. The letters I wrote to Mumbo made me feel quite close to her again. You were like a fairy godmother pulling down that silly wall between us. Offering a theory as to what had happened during these sessions, Miss Gibbs suggested that either the mind of Miss Cummins had the amazing faculty by which she was able to penetrate into the past, present and future of a family completely unknown to her. Or on the other hand, Elizabeth had demonstrated beyond doubt her own survival after death through the psychic powers of a living individual with whom she was unacquainted during her lifetime. Now, I hope you found the detail in Billy and Elizabeth's narratives both useful and thought-provoking. There's much more material about children and the afterlife in books and the internet than I've presented here, but we have to stop somewhere. The main conclusion you might draw from these cases is that the next realm is a purely mental world created by its inhabitants' thought processes. How it seems so solidly real to them is just one of its many mysteries, but I guess we'll find out about these mysteries ourselves sooner or later. Thanks for listening.